want to turn with me please to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. I hope that this is familiar to you. I'm sure we think it would be, being a Christian, Acts 2 is a huge part of the church being birthed. It's the account of the church being birthed. Uh, I did put on the, uh, the app, whoever is on the app, I asked you to read it. Read Acts chapter 2 in preparation for this, because I'm not going to read the whole chapter. But we do need to understand the context of where it is that we're going to go as we go into a few verses. I'm only going to touch possibly half a verse today, but we're going to read from uh, Acts uh, 2, 37 through 47 in a minute or two. It was a few weeks ago that Ryan was speaking, I believe, on children and our responsibilities and bringing them up. It was a great message and a challenging one to myself as a parent. But within that, he went to these verses and was talking about these four pillars of the church, which is the, the doctrine, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. And he said, in passing, maybe we need to look at these verses. And as I sat there, I felt like it was something that I must do. So that's where we're going to go today. And for as long as God decides to speak to me through the Word of God, to go through these verses and have a look at them. So when we look at Acts, what we see is that Jesus has gone back to be with the Father. He has ascended after his death and his resurrection. He has commanded his people, I believe there were 120 of them that went into the upper room. He said to them, go and wait for the promise that I have promised you, which was, of course, the coming of the Spirit of God upon the church, not just to be around, not just to clothe, but to be in people. So he says, go and wait, and they waited, and ten days after the ascension of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came while they were praying in the upper room, fell upon them, tongues of fire were manifested, they were filled with the Spirit, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And as they spoke in tongues, people around them heard them speak in their own languages. There were people, there were Jews, dispersed Jews, etc., who were from all over the place. There, the Passover, Pentecost, sorry, at that time. Many, many people who heard them speak in their own languages. With, there's a lot to that, but I'm not going to be touching that just yet. And so then, Peter stands... After all these people are amazed, Peter stands with the eleven. Make note of that because it is important. He stands with the eleven and he begins to deliver the message because they're surprised and they say, What is this? What actually is going on? They were amazed. These were just Galileans. Uneducated or at least unschooled in the schools of the educated men of the time. So they began speaking in these languages. They were astonished. What is going on? Peter stood. This man who was not too long before afraid and hiding behind closed doors who had been empowered by the Spirit of God. He stood and he preached a message. A message of Christ. Who he is, who he was, what he'd done. Answered the question about what is going on here. So there really is a brief account of that first chapter and partly the second chapter. When we get to verse 37, which is where we're going to begin, then we're not going to go much further than the first half of this verse, but I'm going to read to you from 37 to the end. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children 
and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 40, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There is an immense amount of doctrine in these verses. Things that I can't even plumb the depths of. But if you read them, and if you are God's children, you'll be being pricked in your mind and your conscience now about all the things that are in there. It's why it's vitally important that we go through these things. But we've got to be very careful. One of the tendencies that we have as people, I don't know if you're all readers or not, or, you know, some of you may be, some of you may not be. But if you are, and you've, you've liked to read novels of some kind, it's really good when you start to get to the good bits. You want to get to the good bit. And it's the same with scripture sometimes. We want to get to that bit that said, oh, and 3,000 people were added to their number. 3,000 people were saved. But really we kind of miss out on some of these opening statements. And we overlook them as being just part of the context. <coughs> so here we have these words. Now, when they heard this well maybe we just look at that and think well yeah Peter was preaching I mean yeah they heard it so why, why stop there what, what is there to see well let's have a look shall we I want to ask this question firstly who was it who were they that heard Again, you may be sitting in your chair thinking it's a bit of a strange question. Surely those that heard are those that were there. Well, of course. But we need to make note of a few things. In verse 14, particularly, earlier on, he says in verse 14, that Peter, standing with the eleven, I alluded to that earlier, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, you men of Judea. So he's particularly addressing the men of Judea, his brothers. But then look what he says. You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem. All ye that dwell in Jerusalem. I don't know if you've been to Jerusalem. It's quite a big city. And there are also, of course, many visitors on this day of the feast. In verse 5, we see that they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Lots of people. Now just take this statement out of every nation under heaven. We need to understand this in light that it is hyperbole. That he is just saying that there were people from everywhere from the known world at that time. They were dispersed Jews. Jews that had left, that had gone, that had kind of pushed themselves out of Jerusalem and gone to live in other places. But it also includes what were termed proselytes. 
which are those that are converts to Judaism. So they were, because of their faith, because of their adherence to Judaism, they were counted as Jews. Many, many people. And then we look at verse 9, and we see that it says these people were hearing the, the, these tongues, these languages in their own dialect, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, strangers of Rome. That's where the Rome church came from, by the way. It wasn't planted by Paul. People were in Rome, from Rome at the time, here, and they went back, and the church in Rome was born. Jews, and it says here, Jews and proselytes. So these people that were there were from all these places. Now there is no real way to be certain of how many people were in Jerusalem at the time of this Passover feast. However, Josephus, you may have heard of, was a, a Jewish historian. And he helps us to get a pretty good idea. He made observation that during the Passover feast in the days of the Emperor Nero, which was at the latter end of the life of Paul, it was under Nero that Paul was martyred, around 2,700,200 people attended to take part in the sacrifices. And this number also does not include all those people who for one reason or another couldn't take part in the sacrifices. Unclean people, those who had diseases or one thing or another. 2.7 million people. So when you think about Peter, when he stood with the eleven, the numbers that heard him speak are staggering. Immense amount of numbers. Crowds of people. They heard him. When he stood, and they witnessed this amazing sight, and he gave them the gospel. But it leads us on from there to ask another question. We've seen who it were, who were those people that heard. But the question then, when we look at this term of phrase in 37, now, when they heard this, what, what is it to hear? A really great example of this is found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 through 22, read this way. Hear ye, therefore, the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but jureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Also, he that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh unfruitful. These first three types of ground, or might we say, these three types of heart, they do actually hear the gospel preached. They do hear it. Every time they say, when anyone hears, when he heard, when he heard. Nobody can deny the fact that they have heard the Word of God. The first one, the one in which the seed fell by the wayside, 
This is a person who has no time for the Word of God. You notice that it falls on that which is hard. There is nowhere for the seed to sink at all. It hits the hard ground. It bounces away and it's snatched away by the wicked one. No time for the Word of God. Gives it no real thought. How many times have you been speaking to people about the gospel and they're not interested at all? They don't care. They just want to live life. And I just want to live life. I've got one life to live. When I die, that's it. It's the end. There is no God. By the way, that's false. Nobody on this planet believes there is not a God. There's no such thing as an atheist. They might say they are, but there is not anything as so ridiculous as being termed an atheist. Psalm 19 is clear. And Romans 1 is clear. That everybody knows that God is, even just by creation. Every single person knows. They, they press it down. So, so much so that they convince themselves there is not a God and call themselves an atheist. Nevertheless, these are the people speaking about absolutely no time, no thought. It has no impact on their life, no bearing upon them whatsoever. And so in that sense, it is snatched away by the wicked one. The seed fallen by the wayside where it's all it is is hard, stony ground. So the next one, he hears the word again, he hears it. And what does he do? It falls in the stony ground where it kind of works its way down to a little bit of soil amongst the stones. And he hears it and immediately he receives it with joy. He hears it and he hears something in it that's, that's, that seems wonderful. And it shoots up straight away. How many of you have, in it as a child have planted some cress? And this soil that you go to the next day and it's almost like, you know, the hair's grown overnight. It's like that springs up. There's no depth. No root. And when there is no root, things die very quickly. It says about the sun, it comes and it scorches. The truth is not anchored in the soul. For example... Much like Herod. What did it say about Herod and John the Baptist? He arrested him. John the Baptist was, was shouting off about the fact that he'd married his brother's wife. So he was arrested and put in prison. But it says of Herod that he loved to hear him. Something about what John the Baptist said captured him. He loved to go and visit him in prison and hear what he was saying. And it, just something about it was, 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 was great. It just kind of warmed his heart a little bit. But then what happened? Pressure from his wife. And the nobleman, as he threw his party or whatever it is you want to call it, his daughter or stepdaughter, whatever she was, danced for him and he was grossly... Um, magnetized to it. I'll give you anything you want into half the kingdom. And so she asked for the head of John the Baptist and he, he was grieved. But not at the expense of the nobleman. He was more interested, more, he cared more about his reputation. He cared more about his standing than he did really about what John the Baptist was saying to him. And so therefore, that's what I see as an example. And think of another one. What about King Agrippa? Who was in some ways a friend to the Jews. He knew the Jewish culture. He had fought for them. In fact, it was him that convinced Caligula not to bring emperor worship into the city of Jerusalem. And so, when... He heard Paul speaking. It was noted by Paul that he knew the Jewish culture. He knew all about the Judaism as a religion. 
It's also noted by Paul that this man believed the prophets. And when he heard Paul speak, he confessed and said, Almost thou convinced or persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. The seed fell in the rocky ground. Something about it sprang up and it received something about it with joy. Think about those men who when Paul was speaking, they said, oh, come back next week because we'd love to hear new things. We want to hear more. But was it really about the truth of the gospel or was it because they had something new to put their minds on? Some new doctrine, some new philosophy springs up with joy but when persecution comes, when something comes along to challenge your standing, the sun scorches, whatever was sown dies. And the time will come, let me say this to you, like Herod, like Agrippa, like you and me, if we're only a people who have ground or a heart that receives with joy and no root, there will come a time, I'm to be absolutely sure, there will become a time when this rootless profession will be seen for what it is. Because the Word of God will judge the state of your heart. And the hardness and bitterness toward truth will reign. Just as it did with the false disciples in John 6. You remember, they were called disciples. Jesus even termed them disciples. And yet when they heard him preaching about his body and his blood, eat my flesh, drink my blood, it was too hard. Too hard thing for them. And what it says later on in those, that context of those verses is that they went away, they walked away. And Jesus said, I knew who were not of me to begin with. They were false. And yet they were termed disciples. And they, for a time, followed him. But as I've just said, it will come. If you are false, time will come when you will walk away. It will happen. Because it's, it's easy, isn't it? It's easy to make a profession of belief. In Christ, even. Whilst all is prosperous. Well, we have that good life. When nothing seems to be going wrong, everything seems to be coming our way, it's easy to have a skip in your step, say, I believe. Hallelujah. What happens when we need to decide between love and obedience toward God and our social and professional standing? What happens? Because we can all sit in our seat, comfy as we are this morning, think it's never going to come. But I'm sorry, but we're living in days that are starting just to turn the corner. Right. Will we be content to lose all for Christ? Or will we just be like those where it all springs up and we act the part and live the part for a while, but then we have to walk away because all that we have and all that we are and our, our, sto our social standing, our status in this world is challenged. Will we find ourselves in the shoes of the Puritans and those ministers who for the sake of truth refused to accept the book of prayer in 1662, the great rejection, and many of them left and lost their living, lost everything. Some recanted. And lastly then we have those thorns that choke. The cares of the world, the, the riches and the worldly pursuits that just overshadow, crowd the mind and the heart. They're greater concerns than the truths of the gospel. We have an example there in Matthew 19 where we read of the rich young ruler who came and his intention seemed to be, I, I want to know God, what must I do to be saved? 
Jesus says, you, you know the commandments. And he, he basically says, yeah, I've kept them from my youth. Actually, no, he broke the first one. And this is the words of Matthew 19, 22, when the young man heard that saying, Jesus had said, go and, go and give all your riches away. Go and give them to the poor. Come back and follow me. When he, went to, when he heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Riches and the concerns of this world just robbed what was sown. It was a greater concern to him than his inquiry into being saved. So, what we find then is the fact that they hear and yet they do not hear. They hear but they do not hear. Again, in Matthew 13, in the same context of the parable of the sower, Verses 10 through 15. The disciples came and said to him, Why speakest thou to them in parables? I don't know if I've said this to you before, I think I have. But I grew up, and I'm sure many people have grown up, if you've been in the church for any length of time, Believing that the parables of Jesus were given because he thought we couldn't take the truth of his word. And that he needed to make it more simpler for us. So that we can have a picture and we can look at this picture and say, oh yes, now I see. Thank you for making it so simple, Jesus. That's what I always believed. The disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them? In parables, he answered them and said, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now, there's doctrines here, isn't there? That I'm not going to go into. But don't look at me. And say that you're saying these things. No, the Bible says them. It says here, you've been given the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To them, it has not been given. That's not me saying that. That's the Bible. It was held back. For whosoever hath to him shall be given. And he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is full, uh, fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. If you look back to this context in Isaiah, it's in, I think it's in chapter 6. Where he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and in that context, the question's asked by God, Who shall go for us? Isaiah says, Send me. I'll go. But he's sent with a message, and he's told that they won't listen. To preach to those who will reject. Nevertheless, they heard. And we see there in verse. 11, to them, it's not being given. In our context, in Acts chapter 2, verse 13, after the, uh, they've heard these, these, these tongues, these messages of great praise and, and magnification toward God, which is what they were, were messages from God to man. 
It was adoration, it was, it was doxology, it was magnification of the wonderful works of God in their own dialects and tongues. And some said, what is this? We are astonished, what is this? But then the others, mocking, said these men are full of sweet wine. Two different kinds of hearing. They heard. They even heard and saw the miracle of Galileans speaking in languages, earthly languages, that they could never have learned. And all they could do was mock and say they must be, they must be drunk. Jesus said, didn't he? Matthew 11, 15, Mark 4, 23, and other places, Revelation as well. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And there we see, don't we, with the very statement, he that has ears to hear references and says to us that there are those that have ears to hear and those that don't. And let's move on. John chapter 10. Turning the tide a little bit here. In John chapter 10, we see Jesus himself says, My sheep hear my voice and follow. We'll go to those scriptures in a second. Matthew 13, 16. Again, this context of the sower. He says, but blessed. Speaking to the disciples, he says, but blessed are your eyes. For they see. And your ears, for they hear. And again, in verse 23. But he that received seed into the good ground, is he that heareth the word. He hears it. And understandeth it. We've got to understand, people, that the Word of God must first enter the understanding before it enters the heart. Now, it can enter the understanding and it can stay there and not enter the heart, but it can never enter the heart without it go through the understanding. So it says, he hears the Word and he understandeth it. And then we have this, which you see in none of the other three cases, which also beareth fruit. And bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He receives the word. He understands it by the help of God. But most importantly, he bears fruit. Again, the disciples said, Why, why speakest unto them in parables? And he answered unto them, because it is given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To them, it's not been given. I want to say this to you this morning, that hearing the word is a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And whether you like to hear it or not, it's not me saying this. The Bible has clearly said it. And if you've got your Bible open, you'll read it for yourself. It is both given and held back by God. John 10, verses 1 through 5. Verily, verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, and to him the porter openeth. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. If he has his own sheep, therefore we know that he has sheep that are not his, or there are sheep that are not his. He calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know 
his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Let me tell you that if you are born again of the Spirit of Christ, and he is in you, when somebody comes along to try and sow the seed of error, you'll see it. Maybe it might take a bit of time. But inevitably, you will see it for what it is. Why? Because you hear his voice. And you know that his voice is not in the error. And you know that it's the voice of a stranger. And you know then that you can't follow a stranger because it isn't the voice of the shepherd that's calling you. You'll know it. That's why sometimes people say, you know, surely there are, there are Christians in the Jehovah's Witnesses or in the, in, the, in the Catholic Church. Well, let me tell you this. If somebody is born again by the grace of God in those places, and I'm sure they will be, even though they may fight with the tradition that they've always known and battle with it and find it hard, they will have to come out. Amen. Yeah, amen. They will have to. They won't be able to stay in it. Amen. Because they hear the voice of the Lord. And they cannot stay with the voice of a stranger. Amen. Now let me say this to you as well. It works the other way around. For those who reject Jesus Christ to him, to them he is a stranger. They will not follow his voice because they do not know it. To, to them, to those of the world, to those that are lost, he is a stranger. And they will not follow him because they do not know his voice. Verse 14 through 16 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I'm known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, speaking of the Gentiles. Them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice. There's a certainty. This is not a might be. This is not a they shall hear my voice if they choose and make a decision to follow me. Not if they accept me and accept my sacrifice and say a prayer. This says they will hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. And verse 36. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believed not. You heard. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not. Because, because you've not chosen me, not because you've not made a decision yet, because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall what? Never perish. Neither shall any man. Again I make the note that the word man there isn't actually in the original. It's put there to try and give a better sense of what's being said. But actually it says anything. Neither shall anything pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man or nothing or anything is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Such certainty to those who have heard. Do we see here, do we not, that Jesus Christ is talking to a people who should have seen He's talking to Jews who had the oracles, were given the oracles of the word of God. It was handed to them to look after. But think about when he spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand? 
I'm saying to you here that he's talking about his sheep. And you may come back to me and say, yes, but in John chapter 3 it says, whosoever, whosoever believes upon me. Think about the context. Don't just take a verse. He's speaking to Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel. He's speaking to a Jew. One who thought, I'm a Jew, this is us. Salvation is of the Jews, this is our thing. Not for the dogs, not for the heathen, not for the Gentile. This is not for them. This is for the Jews. And Jesus says, no, wait a minute. This is whosoever. It's no longer just for you. No longer just for the Jews. It's now for whosoever. Who are his sheep that hear his voice? But whosoever? Same thing. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. Romans 10, 14 through 17 says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How then shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh. By hearing. Hearing the word of God. This isn't just about your ears and listening to a message. It's not about you sitting here today and hearing my voice projected through a microphone. This is about spiritual hearing. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. So lastly then. What did they hear? picked out just a few verses from the context of Acts chapter 2 verse 22 through 24 Peter said ye men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know they knew it him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up. You've killed him. Having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden by it. Boy, we listen to much of the preaching in this generation. How many times does the preacher point to the congregation and say, you killed him? Not with your own hands. As far as I'm aware, there's no 2,000 year old people here. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> but you killed him. I killed him. Me. With my sin. Because that's why he went to that cross, because of your wickedness. Because of your vileness. There's no one here who is righteous. Not one. Not one. Verse 31 through 33 says, He, seeing this, speaking of David, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Many of the word of faith the preachers preach that he suffered in hell. Which is wrong. Preached to the souls in prison. Told them of his work. Not that he suffered in hell for us. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. 
Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus who you crucified twice, he said it, who you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they heard about Jesus. They heard about the fact that they knew. He said, he said earlier, didn't he, of you yourselves? No, they didn't know. They knew about it. They knew it. They, 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 they welcomed him in Jerusalem with palm leaves and, and said, Hosanna. And the next breath they're shouting, crucify him. They knew. But all of a sudden, they heard. What was it that Job said? He said, I, I knew of you. I knew about you. Now my eyes see. And now I see that I am violent before your sight. This is about seeing something through the eyes of the Spirit that God Himself has given you. The question now that we have to ask in closing is this. Have you heard? Have you heard? John 5, 38 through 40 says, And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. We search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Here, once again, he's speaking to the Jews. He's speaking to the Pharisees who poured over the scriptures. Thinking that in them and in their magnificence and in their knowledge of them and in their traditions that they find salvation. And yet Jesus says, they testify of me and yet you reject me. What, what point does that have with the question of have you heard? The fact is that we can sit in a church like we are today. It doesn't make you a believer. It doesn't make you a believer because you read the Bible. These people knew the Bible better than you or me. It was given to them. They studied them intensively. They could probably argue doctrines with us and make us look like mere babies. And yet their heart was hard. They put the traditions of men upon the necks of the people. Burdened them. Like to walk around swaggering with their clothes so people could give them honour. Being a religious person, being an ardent churchgoer, even by knowing the scriptures themselves, doesn't make anybody a believer. There's what, quite a full building here this morning. I want to say this soberly, not in a judgmental way, I can't, I can't judge your soul. It's quite likely there's somebody in this room today that's not born again. Quite likely. And the sad thing is, it's probably likely that you think you are. I'm not the judge of that. God is the judge. The scripture does say we're all standing before him and making account. So the question, have you heard the gospel of Christ? Do you understand? Do I understand the depth of my sin? Do you understand the depth of your sin? 
Do you understand your offence against a holy and a righteous and a wonderful and a merciful God? There is such a thing as grace, but grace can be taken for granted. Do you know that you have broken his law? Do you know that you have lived in deliberate and willful rejection? Trodden underfoot the Son of God, encountered the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing. Grieved the Spirit of God. Has the truth that you and your sin and us, all of us. Do you know the truth that it crucified him? I'm not talking about do you understand it here with a mental ascent. Yeah, I've read it. I, I get it. I can read it. You just told me. Do you know it here? Do you know it? Are you broken down for sorrow for sin? I need to know it greater. God help us in this seeker sensitive age. Do you know that it nailed him to the cross? Has that thought penetrated your heart? I want to tell you this. We don't just have blood on our hands. We have the blood of the one and only Son of God, the spotless Lamb on our hands. The question again is this, you have the facts. You have the truth. Do you have ears to hear? Listen, if you do, read these words. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I am talking about grace too. Old things are passed away. Behold, gaze upon this fact, dear friends. Yeah. Look up to it. Look up to the cross. As Ryan mentioned earlier, the serpent on the pole. Look to the cross. In Isaiah chapter 45, I think it is. He says, look to me and be saved. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. And this is the message to anyone. Church veteran or newcomer. Mm. Be ye reconciled to Christ. Be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I want to tell you this morning, dear friends, that if you are in Christ, all your sin is dealt with. It's paid for. Yes, we may have trampled him underfoot. Yes, we may have sinned. Yes, we may have broken his law. Yes, we may be the vilest of creatures. And in our flesh that won't change. We look to Him. We don't look to our own righteousness, but we have none. In fact, the scripture says that our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Do we know what that means? Let me make 
Let me make you aware. It's not very nice. The Bible says it. What does it mean by a filthy rag? It means a woman's menstrual cloth. In the time of her month. That is what your righteousness is contrasted to. We, have, we don't have any. But we have His. Which is an infinite one. Glorious one. And if you are His this morning, you have His righteousness. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I say to you, if you are not, and you will know it, be ye reconciled to God. Turn from your wickedness. Turn to Him. Confess your sin and walk away from it. Turn around. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Put your trust in Him. I want to say to you that tomorrow is a guarantee. And Hebrews 3.15 says this, Today, today, not tomorrow, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. May God bless you. May He save you. And if you are saved this morning, may He cause you to worship Him and honour Him and serve Him and live for Him. The entirety of the life that He's given you. Amen. 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 Turn to the breaking of bread. Thank you.